we have the great satisfaction to have the professor Lydia Edwards in our opening conference today. She has done many things and we only mention a fraction of it um, in, uh, in our opening conference today. Um, Lydia Edwards is a leading academic in the field of internet law. She has taught information technology law, e-commerce law, privacy law, and internet law at undergrad and postgraduate levels since 1996 and have been involved with law and artificial intelligence since 1985. She's the editor and major author of Law, Policy, and Internet, one of the leading textbooks in the field of internet law. She won the Future of Privacy Forum Award in 2019 for Best Paper and the Award for Best Non-Technical Paper at the ACM Conference of Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in 2020 on automated hiring. Hiring, yeah, that's it. I'm gonna check this out. In 2004, she won the Barbara Wellberry Memorial Prize for work on online privacy, where she invented the notion of data trust, a conception with uh, which 10 years later has become has been proposed in, in European Union legislation and is also in my thesis. Exactly. I told her that before. She's a partner in the Horizon, Horizon Digital Economy Hub at Nottingham, the lead, the lead for the Alan Turing Institute on Law and AI, and a fellow in, of the Institute for the Future of Work. Edwards has consulted for the European Union Commission, the OECD, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. And above thing else, at least for me, Professor Edwards co-chairs Geek Law, an annual series of international workshops on the intersections between law, technology, and popular culture. I always, I always wanted to go there, but I never mm -hmm. found the right opportunity for it. It all Still makes time. her the <laughs> yeah, for sure. It always makes her the best person to bring today the most interesting question that you could imagine about law in science fiction. From cyberspace to climate change, why don't science fiction dystopias have any laws? Thank you for being there with, with us this morning, Professor Edwards. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you're going to show a little tiny clip of a video first. This was my sudden idea for waking up people to get into this talk. And then I'll go into my PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and off he goes. Okay, I'll just talk about that while I'm sharing my screen to get the PowerPoint up. Um, here we go. If, if I was with you now, and I must say how sad I am that I'm not with you, which um, my kind host offered to bring me over, but I'm afraid I I win I I woosed out as we say in the UK because I was worried about the COVID thing and everything and would I get trapped in a hotel room for ten days on the other side of the globe or something. So sadly, I'm not with you in person. But if I was, what I would do now is I would stare out into the audience and I would say, "Does anyone know who that was?" You know, and the answer, of course, is that was Elon Musk, the Tony Stark of our reality. Um, who was pretending to launch a new humanoid Tesla robot, but they have not created this product. And word on the street is that they may never do so and that this may just all have been a PR stunt. And so what they did was they got that rather thin guy to come in and dance in a leotard pretending to be a robot. <laughs> 
which I just think is gloriously strange. So one of the reasons why I started with that, apart from the fact that I thought it would fair blow the cobwebs away, I really hate techno, um, is that it ties up with one of my themes in this talk, which is going to be about how imagery and ideas from science fiction and popular culture do inform and perhaps should inform the way that we think about making law, about regulation, about governance of technology in the here and now. OK, now, having said that, um, yeah, I'll, I will pursue that thought for a minute and then maybe come back to this first slide. Whoops. Yeah, if we if we consider um, the way that we thought about robots over the last, you know, even hundred years or earlier, in fact, because there's things like the Golem, you know, in, in Prague, um, then we, we have a very strong tradition of imagery of robots, right, which tell us at least two different messages. So here's one of the earliest iconic pictures we have from cinema. This is Fritz Lang's Metropolis in 1927, which some of you might have seen. I know it's kind of a long time ago, but uh, it does regularly get revived. Sometimes it gets colorized, sometimes they do live audiences with it, because it is this amazing feat of German expressionism. I mean, really, you should see it. So, I mean, loosely, the plot of Metropolis is that there is a robot who is evil, who can, can make herself look like a woman. This is her as the evil Maria, and she is pretending to be the good Maria, who is the heroine of the plot. So that's really all you need to know. I mean, look at the expression. Um, is that this is this really characterizes, I think, the beauty and the strangeness and the fact that we see robots as threatening and evil and deceptive and able to kind of meddle in our affairs. And often for female robots, interestingly, very sexualized as well. So then if you move on in history about robots, you find other imagery. Here's a kind of one from American pop culture history, again, on TV and in films. Robbie the robot who helps out the family in space and is this big clunky thing. Uh, so again, we have a robot who's a bit scary, but is basically comic relief and quite friendly. Um, then we get, you know, later on, we get the, these iconic ideas again of the killer robot coming back in again. So here's the Terminator, probably the single most used image of any kind of, you know, false science fictional technology in the history of our universe. Um, but then again, we still have these images from often from kids TVs, from anime, from manga, uh, from cartoons of robots as cuddly things that we like that are quite intelligent, that are a bit somewhere between pets, kids, friends, humans, right? So that for anyone who hasn't recognized is Wally, -E. Wally, -E. and the more advanced robot that he falls in love with, which actually unusually is one of the few female robots who is not sexualized because she hasn't really got any body parts, it's just got eyes. Um, there's one from a British TV series, which has been quite successful and may even have made it to Canada, which was called Humans. And this featured, you know, synthesized Android robots. Of course, humanoid robots are very popular in film and TV because they can just be played by human beings and you don't have to get any special effects going. So the only thing that was weird about them was that they had strange colored eyes. And this managed to combine all previous kind of uh, discourse ideas in that these robots were simultaneously, some of them were killer robots, they did kill human beings, but also some of them were wonderful, selfless help meets that helped young people, old people, were empathic, cared for children, looked after crippled older men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the, the, the real kind of key things in humans was interestingly a legal battle to give them legal personality, to give them rights so that they couldn't simply be deactivated or destroyed when people no longer wanted them or needed them or even couldn't afford to upgrade them, you know? So issues there about the right to repair and the circular economy actually began to creep in. Um, but the reality, of course, of robots is that they don't look like that at all most of the time. I mean, we're already in a world where we're surrounded by robots. Even you don't have to go to Japan to be surrounded by robots. Um, so here are industrial robots, which we've had since I think the 70s or 80s. Uh, that tend to work in areas that are unpleasant for humans or too dangerous. 
So they started off, for example, painting cars in very noisy factories, unmanned factories. You get robots down mines, you get Romans, uh, you get robots uh, defusing bombs, you get robots down uh, underwater, which is something humans aren't very good at. So, you know, lots and lots of industrial robots. But Law only really began to get interested, I think, in robots when they entered various other domains, one of which was military. So here we have the growth of military robots, the idea of whether there has to be a human in, in the loop or on the link deciding what a military robot or drone does when it drops bombs on people, maybe in Pakistan or wherever. And there's been a lot of interest in drone legislation indeed in the UK lately. Because it turns out that the easy way to shut down an airport is to fly a drone over it. And if it doesn't have, a, you know, permission um, from the Civil Aviation Authority, then they have to shut the whole airport down. So far, this has only been done for the lulls, not by terrorists, but, you know, give it time. Um, another area where we're seeing robots arrive is sex bots, of course, you know, take any new technology and it will emerge as um, part of the sex industry, sadly. Um, that one on the left is a very famous, really odd example of a sex bot. There's a very famous uh, Japanese roboticist who makes these in the shape and form of his wife. That's his wife on the right, which I find really quite strange. But um, And this is a robot that many of you may have in your home. You know, not the kitten. I have a kitten, but it's not a robot. But underneath it, there you can see um, a Roomba. Uh, other vacuum robot vacuum cleaners are available that go around uh, in a kind of drunkard's walk cleaning your floors. So the point of all that, um, other than marveling at it really, about the, the, the dichotomy between the fiction and the reality, is that these fake fictional images, like Elon Musk's uh, not video of a Tesla robot, do form some of our ideas in the population, and that population includes lawmakers and judges and policymakers, about how we should deal with this particular new technology. So for a long time, as I say, I think there has been speculation about whether we treat robots as intrinsically dangerous, the killer robot idea as in Terminator 2, or do we treat them as basically humans that are misunderstood? You know, and again, I would look into the audience normally and ask you, who is, who is this? Who is this? Well, it's Sophia, um, the alleged robot AI created by the government of Saudi Arabia to kind of humanize them. So she is officially legally a citizen of Saudi Arabia and, you know, amusingly, therefore, I think has more rights under Saudi Arabian law than real human women do right now. You know, I think she has the right to vote. Um, so this dichotomy has emerged, <coughs> pardon me, between whether we're scared of robots and see them as essentially a weapon, a weapon of mass destruction as a really terrifying existential threat. This comes through in Nick Bostrom's work and so forth. <coughs> or do we see them as, <coughs> sorry, I think we're getting hay fever season of some kind here. Um, I haven't got COVID, honestly. Do we see them as, um, yeah, basically as pseudo humans that deserve rights? And that's the kind of regulation that we should go for. Well, if you fast forward, this is me looking over to the left on the screen. Sorry, I don't seem to have a pointer. But to the left on the screen, you see the European Parliament resolution from 2017 on recommendations to the Commission on civil law rules on robotics. Now, this was not just a random frolic by the European Parliament. This was actually a really interesting start to the line of work that has gone on in various organs of the EU for the fo following four years on how to regulate artificial intelligence. Um, so it kind of segued from being more about just robots. The robots continue to be a threat to looking at the whole of what they call AI systems. Um, and that has ended up, as I might end up mentioning, with our proposed draft EU AI regulation, which is really the first comprehensive attempt in the Western world to come up with a legislative instrument for making better, safer, fairer, 
more respectful of human rights, AI, you know, and aspires to be a global standard in the same way as the GDPR. So if I fast forward back, if I fast back to this resolution in 2017, it's extremely odd. You do not get many uh, EU documents that start like this. It started like this. Whereas from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein's monster to the classic myth of Pygmalion, one I forgot to mention, through the story of Prague's golem, to the robot of Carol Capek, who coined the word robot, people have fantasized about the possibility of building intelligent machines, more often than not androids with human features. And after they had done this, and after they wrap it on a bit more, there were some absolutely, can I say, bampot suggestions in that early resolution, most notably proposing legal personality for robots. So we're drawing here on our humanoid friend chain of thought from literature, from iconography, despite the fact that there was no evidence in the report whatsoever, that there was actually a technological ground for this, because we all know that robots right now don't are nowhere near strong AI or general artificial intelligence. You know, even machine learning is basically applied statistics and even rule-based systems that have some concept of causality currently have the intelligence of something like, I don't know, a hamster. It's something quite low down the mammal scale. Um, maybe a tortoise. Uh, there was also some ideas in there that drew, I think, on the iconography of them being dangerous, dangerous, dangerous things. So there was this idea that all robots were to have registered keepers, as cars do in the UK. In other words, a human being that would be responsible for them or would be economically liable for them if they caused damage. And that makes sense if you're thinking about Terminator 2, right? Or even maybe a mining robot or an industrial or a military robot, that it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're thinking about a domestic vacuum cleaner. Yeah, we don't have a registered keeper for all of our dishwashers. So again, there's some really confusing ideas that have gone into policy making there. And it's interesting, I won't go into this in detail, though I'd love to. I was just saying to Cristiano that this is my new job, it's working on the AI reg. Um, that where we ended up actually at the end of this, the proposal is essentially consumer product safety legislation. It's very mundane. It's much more sensible. You know, the idea is really let's make technical standards in boring scientific technical standards committees that have a global network. And if you can self-certify that you are in compliance with them, which is just what you do for dishwashers and fridges and medical devices, then and toys, then you are deemed to be safe to go and be sold into the EU. OK, there's also issues of reforming product liability, but I just think that was a really interesting work to example. So um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go back to my introduction a sec. Sorry, I said to Cristiano that I had basically rewritten this entire talk uh, in the last sort of hour. What I, I think the reason I was invited, as, as Cristiano adverted, is because for the last 15 years, I have been chairing or helping to run this conference called Geeky, which is a silly name that we dreamt up, that is somewhere between geek with a G-E-E-K, you know, the geeks have now inherited the world, uh, wiki, as in a repository of kind of information, and the II at the end really drew on Information Institute. So in law now, we often have these things called things like Osley or Bailey, or you have Canley in Canada, if any of you knew, where we are depositing essentially electronic copies of all the law that we can find, statutes, cases, etc. So Geeky combined all three of these ideas from kind of law, technology, and popular culture. Yeah. And we started it in 2006 with some money that we found down the back of the couch, effectively. It's never had big sponsorship. It's never been sponsored by Google or Facebook or anybody. It's for, it's for the lulls again. And the idea of Geeky is that you can do interesting things by taking a critical analytical focus that draws on law, technology and popular culture and the popular culture picks you can see there you know superheroes the starship enterprise have featured quite prominently in geeky so popular culture when you're talking about technology does tend to end up being science fiction though not always we have had other genres being drawn on 
Um, Geeky's been very successful, bizarrely. Um, we thought the first one, as I say, was a bit of a joke for about 15 people with, as I say, this tiny bit of money we found down the back of the couch in Edinburgh, which is where I was teaching at the time. But no, it became very successful. and People are always bidding for it. It's left the UK, gone abroad. It's even had little uh, spin-offs in Australia and a few other countries. Um, in last year, it uh, came out in 2020, got a bit delayed by the pandemic, I think, in really kind of making it out into the world. But we put out a book called Future Law, um, Emerging Technology Regulation and Ethics, which drew on the geeky papers to try to give you a kind of sampler, or we kept calling it our primer, as to the geeky idea. And I edited that with my colleagues, Burkhard Schaefer and Idina Harbinja, to whom I am very grateful, particularly Idina, who did most of the editing. Um, so if I go past the robots again, I think what I thought would be interesting to do would be to talk about particularly um, the two types of papers that we've tended to have at Geeky, yeah? And then hopefully, if someone tells me how much time I have, ah, not that much, to um, talk a little bit, but trying to answer the question I set myself when I dreamt up the title of the talk before I'd written it, okay? So I'm not going to talk about this. I'm saying this is the first type of talk you get at Geeky, which is really, let's throw the law at a technology and see where we get. And that's been really useful, actually. I mean, as you can see, there's a long list of technologies there since 2006, which Geeky has kind of worked its way through. Everything from social networking through virtual reality to biotech, transhumanism, smart cities, AIs and algorithms, blockchain. And we just had one last week where there was a lot of discussion of NFTs. So it's a great place to go and really workshop your idea about how this new technology that is in some way disruptive of the society and legal policy should be addressed. But where things, and that's just a few more papers and things to talk about, uh, so I, are, I like IR lawyer cap, this are serious legal issue, that's doge speak. But what gets, I think, really interesting and was really quite unique and geeky when we started uh, 15 years ago, was this idea of combining that focus on law and technology with popular culture. So why is that useful? OK, you know, other than being fun, which it really, really is. And I say to any of you come to Geeky, right? It's a shame I didn't tell you earlier because the last two years have been virtual. But still, we're hoping to be back in real life next year. So what how can popular culture help us understand, critique and create better law and regulation? And I think um, it, it lets your imagination have a bit of space. It gives us an idea for a start off of what society finds worrying or confusing or engaging, attractive about a new technology. And connected to that idea of societal response and societal attitudes, I think you then get an idea of how society might look at laws governing these new technological ideas, right? Sometimes now, this is called the black mirror effect, um, I hope you've had Black Mirror in Canada. This started well after Geeky, please note. But Black Mirror is an anthology series uh, masterminded by a guy called Charlie Brooker, who started off as a video games and TV journalist. He's very sharp, very smart, really in touch with modern culture. Um, it's now been bought uh, quite a long time now, been bought by Netflix, so it's more globally available, but started off on Channel 4 in the UK. And um, Black Mirror has been tremendous at doing this, actually. It's not particularly legal, but it certainly has an awareness of law and policy, and it has dealt with a variety of scenarios around science fictional surveillance and punishment and social networking and um, biohacking and tried often to horrify us really with what might happen. In a lot of ways, it is the new technological uh, twilight zone. You know, there's the odd happy one, but not many. And one that most people have heard of actually, at least most people in technology law, is the episode called Nosedive, which really, really, really kind of drew on or anticipated uh, the, the Chinese idea of social scoring, of, of, of social filtering. 
And that's a picture from nosedive to the side. The basic idea is that this is a future where everyone carries their phones around, so no change there, right? But whenever they meet people, their neighbors, strangers in a queue, whatever, they mark them. So that's a rating on the side. If someone behaves badly, like holding up the queue by complaining, they mark her down in the rating. Her social score falls and the consequences of that are very germane and are exactly what happened, in fact, in China during the pandemic, which are that it becomes difficult for you to take public transport, it becomes difficult for you to enter buildings. Uh, in China, in places like, like Hangzhou, during the pandemic, they had apps which gave you a score as to your COVID kind of COVID risk analysis. And you might find that you were locked, for example, out of your apartment complex, because most of these apartment complexes in big cities in China have automatable lockable uh, entry gates to them. So Nosedive, uh, in many ways, probably actually inspired, I think, the part of the draft proposed EU AI directive, regulation, sorry, which singles out Chinese style social scoring um, as one of the particularly unacceptable risks of AI. It's a very short list. And that is one of them, which they say is unacceptable and therefore should be prohibited in throughout the EU. So I think Nosedive and Black Mirror generally have really kind of highlighted to the world, to the policymaking world, in fact, the idea that looking at these extreme science fictional societies can help us to understand what's wrong with current laws, where they might go horribly wrong, where good ideas might go bad. You know, so these become both pedagogical and policy tools, you know, for your students and also for your policymakers. And one point I'd throw in there is that I think it allows discussion of the unthinkable. So, you know, and in another uh, set of Black Mirror programs, and it's also picked up in a paper we had at Geeky based on Ian Banks culture novels, there's discussion of different types of virtual punishment. So if you assume a technology that allows for um, time dilation so that you virtually can be placed into prison and it seems like a hundred years to you, uh, but it's actually only been two minutes. Now it seems in physics that it's not gonna be at all impossible to do this quite soon. Um, then would that be ethical? Would it be legal? Would it be in American terminology, cruel and unusual punishment? Would it be a form of torture? Would it be of util utilitarian use? Because you could have people who were in prison for a hundred years in their head, maybe got re rehabilitated in some way or other, but they come out two minutes later and they can be uh, contributing members of society. It's a lot cheaper, right? We spend a fortune as a society locking people up, you know? So you can have a discussion there. Should you be tortured in that? virtual space should that be allowed we see that in altered carbon where there is virtual torture to achieve law enforcement goals uh, my colleague Barker Schaefer who did the paper on it suggested that this might be ethical if you then applied a right to forget where you forgot everything that happened to you during your 100 years imprisonment and torture but in that case would there be a, re a rehabilitative effect is there a kind of muscle memory of the mind about the fact that you've been trained during this virtual time into being a better person? Now, it's incredibly hard to talk about these things in any realistic sense. And yet, in some ways, this is a valuable debate for thinking about, A, what's the value of very long sentences, like whole life sentences? What's the balance between society, things like the cost of society, and, um, you know, moral growth in this population or deterrence and it just lets you play with these ideas in a way that seems quite horrendous perhaps without putting it in a science fictional um, domain so i think again these help us to think out what's where what's the line between law and ethics what should we be regulating what should we be leaving to personal moral codes What's the line between societal good and individual liberty? These are all issues that we talk about all the time in law, I think, you know, as a, as a teacher, as a citizen. 
And these are all these social imaginaries. They sometimes get so called socio-technical imaginaries, which is a phrase I don't fully know what it means because I'm a lawyer, not an STS person, but I hear it around. So the, these imaginaries let you play with these ideas. They let you be playful, which is what I put at the end. So playful as well as precautionary lets you think about good things the law might do or good places society might go as well as the horrors the precautionary tales which is what black mirror tends to specialize in now i've already now been talking for 40 minutes and i haven't done most of the talk so let me just pick out uh, maybe one or a couple more things all right and then i'll try and stop so we've got time for questions but you can have the whole talk okay to take home to your beds. Um, so here's uh, one of my favorite talks ever that I gave, and this is from Geeky in Berlin in 2015. Now this spoke to me very personally at the time because as it says, conceptions of privacy in the Marvel universe, I had become, I was beginning at this point to be extremely involved in looking at privacy, data protection, and beginning to look at its implications in terms of AI and algorithms. I did my first algorithms paper at Geeky in 2013. Um, but also then the subtitle, or how Daredevil cured a hole in my stroke life stomach. So what had happened here was that I had uh, been quite ill because I had a perforated stomach ulcer and I was in hospital and I had to recuperate. And during that time, I'd always been a comics fan, but I hadn't had a lot of time. I read several years, really about a decade's worth of Daredevil comics in quick succession and came up with some, I think, kind of interesting stroke crazy ideas. So the background of Daredevil, who's one of my, my favorite superhero is that he is essentially the Marvel Universe Batman. They call him Red Batman sometimes, in that he is a vigilante of the night who doesn't have any superpowers and he also isn't mega rich, unlike Batman, and goes out to fight crime, right, on the mean streets of New York, essentially. Um, but the twist in the Marvel Universe is that he is both blind and a lawyer, okay? So clever, clever, it's blind justice, right? Uh, and therefore, there is an obvious dichotomy between his day, his his nightlife as a superhero who beats people up, doesn't kill them, but beats them up without due process or justice, just like Batman, and his day job as a lawyer, which is increasingly portrayed as a thoughtful lawyer who defends criminals on human rights grounds, who takes racial bias cases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this huge trade-off between respect for the rule of law by day and being a vigilante by night. It leads very interesting places. Um, but where I was interested was I was a privacy lawyer. Um, this was around about the time again that um, people were becoming very concerned about how people behaved online under the cover of anonymity with a mask on, if you like. And what this series followed was um, this, uh, this idea to the left, you can see this, this cover. This is from one of the, the beginning of the, the, the arc by Brian Michael Bendis and Alex Meleev, in which Daredevil, the lawyer, Matt Murdock, is outed um, as Daredevil, okay? So his secret identity is given away by a long series of coincidences. And what kind of happens next? And it goes on for decades in the comics. It is immensely kind of rich discussion, actually. As, and what is also interesting is that because it goes on for decades, the writers change. This is one of the fascinations of comics for me. It is long form storytelling, like kind of Norse sagas, you know, or Greek myths, in that there are multiple pairs of hands over a very long time that interpret the same ideas, the same basic ideas in different ways because they personally have different kind of head stories. You know, they have different internal moralities and, and upbringings. So we started off with a pair in Bendis and Malayev who were drawing, I suppose, on a traditional idea that secrecy was a good thing, right, for a superhero, that secrecy protected your identity it allowed you to operate with these multiple identities. So bringing in kind of almost modern ideas of role playing or repertoire behavior. And um, in these um, pictures that I have here, which I can't see because the character, the thing is in the way, just moved it. You see in a convoluted setup, Daredevil putting another superhero on the stand in a trial 
to try to defend the idea of having a secret identity, even if you are essentially a lawyer. Um, and this is Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four, Mr. Fantastic, saying, yeah, you know, I don't use a secret identity, but I totally understand that people need to because you're putting yourself out there. You're making yourself a target. People would hurt you if they knew who you were. They would get it. Your loved ones in your civilian life, they would take revenge on you um, and you have to protect yourself with anonymity. Right. But then the more interesting bit, because we've heard that a million times. Right. Is that. Daredevil, the lawyer, Matt Murdock, goes on to say, but why, okay, why not just wear a mask around your head? You know, why have a whole identity, a costume, a symbol? Why Spider-Man, Thor, Daredevil? Why the, the whole get up? And Reed Richards says, well, it's a clearer way to express yourself to the public. Sometimes it's a personal symbol. Sometimes it's something that means something to the individual. Sometimes it means something larger, something significant or cultural. So the idea, it seemed to me, was that Benders and Malayev were, you know, probably accidentally almost putting forward the idea that your identity was needed protection, that you could have multiple identities, that secrecy could be good as a technique for generating these multiple identities in which you might operate. And do you think a little bit about people online where we're constantly told that anonymity is bad, that anonymity just protects trolls. And yet the evidence over and over when people do studies is that anonymity is used primarily for all kinds of good purposes, like being able to speak freely when you're worried that you might prejudice your job, your employment, like being able to speak freely politically without people judging you on whether you're young or old or black or poor or whatever. You know, that it's useful if you want to play around with your sexuality, you know, so it's often LGBT plus groups that are very keen on there being anonymity or pseudonymity online. But then the writers change. And later on, you get this storyline in which, you know, rather than fighting to protect his identity or to get his secret identity back, which Daredevil by this stage has spent about 10 years trying to do by, by different means. Um, Daredevil again in court, Matt Murdock again in another court case. It's a really great comic for looking at made up court cases. Um, says, actually, I have decided that this is living a lie, that having a secret identity is not um, effectual secrecy. It is lies and deception. And he says, you know, people say, are you Spider-Man? Are you really Spider-Man? Are you really Daredevil? And you have to look them dead in the eye and say, absolutely not, because you can justify a lie if lives are riding on it. And you go on. And then he says, even as you fight for, as the saying goes, truth and justice, even if you're a lawyer who has sworn to live by the truth, it's a very idealistic portrayal of lawyers. You will willingly bear false witness. And he says, well, you know, I've lied all this time. I've lied to protect my friends. I've lied to protect my career. And I wasn't keen on it, but I did it. But then what we see, and I've skipped a lot because I'm afraid this was originally like a 50 minute talk, is he outs himself all over again. You know, he's got to the point where he probably could say it was all a mistake. I'm not Daredevil. And he chooses instead in court to go, my name is Daredevil. Right. And then we get a long series in which he has no secret identity. And what this is portrayed by, by Mark Wade, who um, at the time, you know, I read a little bit about interesting writer, also written for TV, had a history of depression. I think is the idea that this time anonymity is uh, pernicious to the soul, that there is one identity and that you need to heal yourself and have that one identity by means of openness. And in fact, why is it not doing it? Oh, sorry, it's frozen. Ah, there we go. Sorry, can you see that okay? In fact, we get this really bizarre bit where he's dressed up in this outfit, which is a sort of crossover between being a lawyer and being daredevil, you know, so he's wearing a bright red three piece suit, which is just horrible. But I do think it's a very interesting analysis, as I say, over 10 years of secrecy, anonymity, pseudonymity and identity. And 
it speaks now quite a lot to where we are now in the UK with the online safety bill and with the general feelings in most countries that social media needs to be tightened up, that we need to have you know, rules against being anonymous, that you, you begin to see some of the arguments on either side. So there's lots of things I was going to say here about other geeky talks and about state surveillance and so forth, but I won't, okay? I would love to come back to any of these people who want to ask me questions. This is another one where I felt that I, I did a harder legal analysis, not just that kind of metaphor, or, you know, law and literature analysis, where I looked at this idea again from Black Mirror of there being post-mortem avatars of yourself built from your Facebook posts, your emails, your texts, your pictures that were on Instagram or saved on Google Drive, you can build a whole new person. So the idea here was that he had died, that guy there that you see on the right, and his girlfriend rebuilds him as a post-mortem avatar. This was one of the ones where the minute that I'd done the talk, um, Reality caught up with me, more or less. It turned out Microsoft had a patent to do exactly this. There has been many such systems people are now trying to build, not with bodies, but digitally, and it's becoming very hot. And what I like, and this went into the geeky book, into the future law book, was that in this paper, we actually did a hard legal analysis of what rights do you have over these very personal materials after you are dead? Do you have rights in respect of your personal data after you are dead? No. What happens to the copyrights in your textual materials after you're dead? Well, they go to your heirs and they can do what they like with them. So do you have any post-mortem privacy? And that became, or that has become, a whole stream of work between myself and my, my former PhD student, Idina Herbinja, as previously mentioned, who does all the work. So that's one I'm very happy to come back to. Um, so finally, I don't even know what time it is, way late okay I will just try and say something that almost answers the question I set myself because some of you might have turned up wanting to know about that uh, and it was something about why don't science fiction dystopias have any laws um, little apology here actually that I mainly talked about films and tv and comics I know they just seem to be easier to write talks about if you look and again I won't go into this it's probably another whole talk um, there does seem to be a lot more law in genre TV uh, and comics and films than there is in hard literature, as it were. I'm not quite sure why. I have a few ideas over the page. Obviously, probably everyone's heard of Asimov's Three Laws for Robots. And indeed, I have got, uh, I did a project, I've got a publication that plays on this and turns it into laws not for robots, who has previously said can't make law for robots. They're not persons. They don't have legal personality. They're not strong AI. They don't have human intelligence. Forget that. But you can make laws for roboticists, for the people who design robots. And that's what we did in this project for a UK funding council called EPSERC. Um, so that's the outstanding example in actual science fiction literature, I think, of the law getting involved. But it isn't really law. It's really just excuses to tell little detective stories. You know, it's just little puzzles. And that's what you tend to see in a lot of literature interaction with law. Yeah. So why is this? Why, why don't you get much law in science fiction literature? Um, well, my straight answer is it would get in the way of the plot. <laughs> You know, if you take so many novels, you know, the works of Ian Banks, Dave Eggers, The Circle, which is about a kind of Google-like corporation kind of taking over the world, then privacy rights would ruin them. Um, due process would generally ruin them. You couldn't have minority report about pre-crime in a world in which people actually did have rights to a fair trial. Uh, and so I think that's generally why rights, especially human rights and privacy, do get shoveled off to the side. Um, some novels do occasionally explain that laws have changed, but they rarely go into any detail on how it happened. Why wasn't there a case in the Supreme Court? You know, why didn't somebody go to Strasbourg? How did Gilead get to where we find it? I think it is probably mentioned in about two lines that there was some kind of revolution. But, you know, on the other hand, seeing Afghanistan, you do see how rights disappear overnight. So I have found that salutary. And as I say, I think often where you do get law, SF and technology in uh, literature, 
the law is very frequently just a background idea. Uh, here's one of my favorite examples, which is the novel, which again, I suggest to everybody, oh no, typo, sorry, called Alfred Bester's The Demolished Man from 1953, but incredibly ahead of its time as a novel, you know, absolutely zingy and psychedelic. Um, and the basic idea of this is I want to commit a murder, but how do I commit a murder when we have telepathic detectives, right? This is a society that contains telepaths. Um, and that could have been very interesting legally. It'd be very interesting actually to go back and do a paper on that one, right? In terms of, you know, how does your right to privacy in your head stack up against the interests of society? What kind of warrant would the detectives get? You know, would you compare it to wiretapping and communications interception in the UK under the Investigatory Powers Act? But that's not what this novel does, which is unsurprising as Alfred Bester was from a marketing background, not a lawyer. Um, the issue is how do it, how do how does he get away with it? You know, as opposed to who done it. It's not about deconstructing the law. And that's what you tend to see. And I think as much as anything, that's also because science fiction writers are often struggling already with having to get the hang of the technology for them to have to get the hang of law as well is possibly asking a bit much but and this is absolutely the last thing I will say I do recommend I think I'm beginning to see a new kind of genre where I am seeing people using law in interesting ways to actually kind of further the plot and this is my outstanding example which is Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future which I again really recommend and which some of you may have come across because it's had a lot of publicity and this is a climate change novel um, climate change science fiction is now being called cli-fi, I understand, which sounds extremely rude, so I won't call it that. But Kim Stanley Robinson has um, form. Uh, he is a science fiction writer. His PhD was on the novels of Philip K. Dick. He's not a scientist, but he does seem to have worked extensively with scientists and, and policymakers uh, for the last 20 years or longer. Um, I think his wife might be in government somewhere. And so he really does seem to have a clue about how technology and law interact. And he has a clue also about how to present this in science fiction to try to influence policymakers. And since he is ha and has been for a very long time obsessed with climate change, ecology, you know, uh, making a better world in the future. That's what he is working in the genre for now, I think. So the basic idea of ministry for the future is that he suggests that under the Paris Agreement, there should be a body put in place that acts for the benefit and the interests of those who are not yet born. Because us right now, if we do a balance between, yeah, I can still have my car, I can still get on a plane, I can throw away my rubbish without having to recycle it, then we tend to lean in that direction because we're selfish and we live in the now. But if you think about the people coming, who'll be growing up in a world in which everything is on fire, then that balance shifts. And when it's in abstract, it's hard to kind of get that over. But when you think about actually, I'm acting for the people who are yet to come, then it becomes more concrete. Now, so as a former property and trust lawyer, I also found that very interesting. You know, it's a bit like, oops, I don't mean to do that. It's a bit like a, almost a rule for perpetuities as opposed to a rule against perpetuities that we have to keep thinking about the generations not yet born. And it's, it's a very well-researched book. I mean, in a way, it's almost like doing an online course in climate change rather than reading a science fiction novel. I mean, it's heavy. But there are lots and lots of really interesting legal solutions within, within it. You know, for example, playing with the fiscal setup. He talks about legislating for carbon coins, which is somewhere between crypto and, and sort of encouraging uh, carbon, up, you know, less, less use of carbon. He also has some interesting parts about passing laws to commodify personal data, which I am completely opposed to. And I'm really interested that someone who seems generally so on the ball has gone with such a, a bad idea. But there's also an ethical part to it, which I think is very interesting, which is when could you justify climate change terrorism? You know, for example, he has a kind of black ops wing of the Ministry for the Future, which is doing things like bringing down planes, you know, rather relevant, you know, just a few days after 20 year anniversary of 9-11. So we certainly don't justify that kind of thing for state based terrorism. 
but could we justify it if the aim is to save the entire world from climate change? So yeah, yeah, I do think that's an interesting one to look at in terms of literary fiction and the interaction of law and technology and the future. And I will stop there and stop sharing my screen. <laughs>